So my name is Dr. Gandhi, I'm a colon and rectal surgeon at Tri-City Medical Center. Um, so my goal today is basically to kind of educate you on different things that can ail your bottom, so to speak, and to kind of tell you how I go about diagnosing it, what the options are, and hopefully at the end of this, teach you how to prevent this from even happening to you. I keep my lectures very informal, so interrupt me at any point in time. If you have a question, ask me. Blurt it out, raise your hand, whatever you feel comfortable doing. If there's something I go over and you don't understand, you want me to explain it again, Interrupt me, so very informal. Topics we're gonna to be covering today, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, and fiber. So, anal fissure. If you've ever had this, you know what it is. For those of you that haven't, I can tell you right off the bat, it is very, very painful. What is it? So basically, it looks like a crack in the butt. And it, for lack of a better term, that's exactly what it is. It's a tear in the lining of the skin right in your anus. And I'm gonna show you pictures in a little bit to explain what I'm talking about. Who gets it? Most of the people that come into my office are usually young males or young females that have not had children or older males. Rarely do I see this in the older females. Symptoms, pain. Most of the time they're always complaining of pain. They're afraid to go to the bathroom because it hurts so bad. When I ask them, can you describe the pain? They'll tell me it's like passing shards of glass where it feels like someone just cuts them with a razor blade or pours vinegar across an open wound every time they go to the bathroom. So that's the most common complaint. Blood. They'll say that every time they wipe the toilet, they'll see a little bit of blood. So it doesn't necessarily drop into the toilet, but they'll see it on the toilet paper. And that scares a lot of people, obviously. Fear of bowel movements. We talked about that. Why? Because it hurts every time they go. So they try to stop and not go to the bathroom. Sometimes they'll hold it for two days just to avoid going to the bathroom. Itching. What will happen is after they get done wiping and cleaning up, they'll complain of itching for about half an hour, maybe a couple hours afterwards. Some people tend to have the itching worse at night, but it varies from person to person. Some people can't sit down in a chair for a long period of time when they have fissures because they'll say it just hurts too much to sit for long periods of time. They'll also say that after they sit for a long period of time, the itching tends to get worse. So these are just a few, but not all the symptoms that fissures can cause. How does it occur? Tidiness. Literally, that's how it occurs. So men are inherently born with more muscle around their sphincter muscle than women are. As we go through life, women, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, have to be the ones to go through the childbirthing process. So through that process, that takes a wear and tear on their sphincter muscle. Men don't have to go through that trauma, so our sphincter muscle pretty much stays strong and vigorous our entire life. And what happens is when you get that tear, you start getting spasming of that sphincter muscle, and that's what the pain is caused by, it hurts. Most people can remember exactly when the fissure occurred. They'll say, oh yeah, it started two weeks ago, I had a really bad bowel movement, it, would, it just hurt. And ever since then, it's just been hurting nonstop. Usually what'll happen is this happens in people that aren't necessarily regular, but people that have problems with constipation in the sense that, not that they're not going every day, but that they have to strain to move their bowels. It can also happen with really bad diarrhea as well. So not often, but it can happen with diarrhea. But the reason for that is it causes a chemical burn in the exact same place. And so it looks just like someone had a large bowel movement and it tore their sphincter. So this is exactly what it looks like. So you see this little tear right here. And that's exactly what I look for in the office. And that little thing causes a world of hurt. Here's another one. This little thing. It looks harmless, but let me tell you, if you've ever had one, or you, you have a friend that's ever had one, they'll tell you it's, it's not harmless, anything but. And that's what I look for in examining the office. Once I see that, I don't need to proceed any further because I know my answer right then and there is what I'm going to do. First and foremost, be wary of any doctor that tries to treat you without taking a look. I can't tell you how many. I can't tell you how many times. Six times in the. I've been here in the Tri City for 13 months now. Six times in those 13 months, I've had patients come in with either a diagnosis of hemorrhoids or fissures that either they were self-treating or their primary care doctors were self-treating. Those six patients had anal cancer. And the only reason that I know that is because I was the first person to take a look in however long they've had those symptoms. So be wary of any person that starts treating you without taking a look. If you take nothing away from today, take that away. So treatment, what do I do when people come in with this problem? Well, being American, most of us 
don't get enough fiber in our diet. It's just the way we are. We're all about work, work, work. We don't pay enough attention to our diet. We eat a lot of processed foods. It's just the nature of the beast, the way our society is. When you go to some Eastern cultures, you know, you go to Asia, India, things like that, they get a lot more fiber in their diet. And so they don't have to worry about these sorts of things. They have to worry about other problems, but not these problems. And so first and foremost, I try to educate my patients on what it means to get more fiber in your diet. So the average American uh, in his or her diet gets about 12 grams of fiber in the diet. That's average. If you eat a high fiber diet, you may get about 15 to 17 grams of fiber in your diet. Unfortunately, that's less than half of what you need. You need about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. So most people can probably get that one day a week. Most people can probably even get that two days a week if they really try. But to get it seven days a week, 365 days a year, you pretty much have to quit working and just focus on counting your grams of fiber to get all that fiber. So I'm going to teach you later on how to get that amount of fiber. But that's the, one, that's the first thing I tell people, is that we've got to increase the amount of fiber in your diet. Number two, there's a number of ointments I also prescribe. And what those ointments do is they basically relax the sphincter muscle. What somebody brilliantly figured out is that Cardiologists used to use medications to relax the heart muscle and relax the muscles of the blood vessels to allow more blood flow. Well, the problem down here was basically the sphincter is just so tight that the blood can't get in there to heal the tear. So what someone wisely or unwisely, depending on what they were actually trying to do, figured out is if you take those blood pressure medications and you make them into a paste and you put them on the inside of the anus right on the sphincter muscle, it actually relaxes the muscle and allows the blood flow to that area to increase. And so those are a lot of the medications we use. You might recognize names, uh, nitroglycerin, diltiazin, nifedipine. They're all cardiology medications. All we do is make them into a paste of a certain concentration, and we apply them in the anus, and it relaxes the sphincter muscle and allows that tear to heal. Last resort, rarely, rarely, even though I'm a surgeon, I try to keep all my patients out of the operating room. My philosophy is if it's not an emergency and it's not cancer, we can always operate later on. But if we're overly aggressive and we operate and something happens, we can never go back. So surgery is my ace in the hole. I save it when nothing else is working. So Botox injection. So you know, as we get older, obviously we don't look as good as we used to in our 20s and 30s, and you know, people end up getting Botox in the face. Somebody figured out is that, hey, if I inject Botox into the anus, I can paralyze that muscle and keep it from spasming. So what we do sometimes is that if people don't want to be overly aggressive, if they're a little nervous about having surgery down there, I'll take them to the operating room and I'll inject Botox into their sphincter muscle to paralyze it. Good news is the effects only last six months. So if you have one of the side effects from the Botox, such as minor leakage to gas or liquids, the effects wear off in six months. The bad news is the effects wear off in six months. So if everything heals and in month seven you have a bad bowel movement that was real hard because you got away from your fiber for a week or two, well we start the process all over again. So that is one of the things that are at our uh, availability. Sphincterotomy. What that basically is is that I go in and I cut a portion of the sphincter muscle. I use that as a last resort because once I cut it, I can't really go back and fix it later on. So I do this when everything else has failed. But the majority of people, when they have this surgery, they're glad because it changes their quality of life and it makes it so they can function properly. Best treatment is prevention. Just like with anything else in life, don't even let it happen. Fiber and water. We're going to talk about at the end of the lecture how to, how to count your fiber, what sources are good for getting fiber, and how to prevent this from happening to you. Before I go any further, any questions or anything anybody wants me to go over uh, on fissures? Fair enough. I'll, by the way, I'll be around afterwards because I can understand how people wouldn't want to ask certain things about their dog. So. I'm not naive, I understand that. So. Next we'll talk about hemorrhoids. So who has them? Everybody in this room has hemorrhoids. Your six week old baby has hemorrhoids. Everybody has them. We need them and I'll explain to you in a moment why we need them. Who has problems with hemorrhoids? So this becomes a little bit of an issue. So men and women of all ages have problems with hemorrhoids, especially uh, once you get over the age of 50, because the wear and tear of your body starts to begin to show itself at that point in time. Pregnant females, if uh, any of your wives, sisters, aunts, any of you females in here have had uh, you know, long pregnancies, you know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of your hemorrhoids. What are they? So when I mentioned everybody in this room has hemorrhoids, what I'm talking about is these little blue things you see right here, those are hemorrhoids, and then these little blue things right here are hemorrhoids. So most people don't know we have two types of hemorrhoids. First type is internal hemorrhoids. Just like they sound, they're on the inside. Everybody has these. 
unless you don't have an anus, which is quite possible. So if you have an anus, you have hemorrhoids. <laughs> now, I don't mean that to be a joke. I mean, th there are certain people with cancer that obviously we close everything up and get them permanent back. So those people don't have hemorrhoids because we take them out at the time of surgery. So the other group, external hemorrhoids, and these are on the outside. So there's two different types of hemorrhoids. When these internal ones grow, they start to look like this a little bit. The external ones, when they start to grow, they start to look like a little marble on the outside. And I have pictures to kind of show you what I'm talking about. In terms of a little bit to go over a little bit more of the anatomy, so there's two types of sphincter muscle we have as well. We have an internal sphincter muscle and we have an external sphincter muscle. Your internal sphincter muscle always stays contracted when you're talking. Your exercises, whatever it is you're doing, it's contracted 24/7. Your external sphincter muscle is always relaxed. Whatever you're doing, you just kind of relax. So, if you have a bowel movement, both of them relax. Your internal sphincter muscle relaxes, so you can pass the bowel movement. The external sphincter muscle was already relaxed to begin with, so it doesn't do anything. But let's say you're in public and you know you have bad gas and you're trying to pucker and not do anything. Well, your internal sphincter muscle is already contracted because it's always contracted. But the one you, you can actually squeeze to keep anything from coming out, that's your external sphincter muscle. And that's how the two differentiate. Internal sphincter muscle is involuntary, it's always contracted. Your external sphincter muscle is voluntary. That's the one you can relax and squeeze at will. Do we need them? Yes, we need our, uh, we need our hemorrhoids. The reason being is there are three things that keep us from pooping on ourselves. Our internal sphincter muscle, our external sphincter muscle, and our hemorrhoids. The hemorrhoids provide about 15 to 20 percent of our continents. So, in people that don't have hemorrhoids because of hemorrhoid surgery, they may, as they get older, they may have problems with leakage and incontinence and things like that. And I'm going to tell you why that uh, happens. Because as you get older, your sphincter muscle, the muscle, just like we have atrophy in our biceps, chest, legs, things like that, that's no different. That muscle begins to atrophy and get weaker as we get older as well. So, if you had surgery in your, let's say, your 30s or 40s for hemorrhoids and things like that. You're young, it doesn't show up. Again, that wear and tear starts to show in your 50s, 60s, 70s as you get older, and your sphincter muscles can't compensate for not having that added boost from the hemorrhoid cushions. And so that's why uh, they are responsible for our continence. The other thing they do is that when you sneeze, when you cough, when you do anything that contracts your stomach muscle or forces you to push against your stomach muscle, there's also a blood rush going down to those hemorrhoid cushions. So what happens is when you cough or sneeze, these things engorge with blood. As they engorge with blood, they contract and they keep the anus closed. So they keep you from pooping on yourself when you sneeze or passing gas when you sneeze and things like that. So that's the other way they help us out. Common symptoms. So these are not, obviously, you know, they can, there can be some overlap and these aren't the only symptoms. But when we talk about external hemorrhoids, we talk about itching. So some of my patients will say that it just kind of itches down there. You know, I feel these uh, flaps of skin down there and it itches. Uh, it's just sometimes worse at night, sometimes after a bowel movement. Then I have a tough time keeping clean down there. They'll say, I just, no matter how much I wipe, I just keep wiping and wiping and wiping, I just can't seem to get clean down there. The thing they'll say is that some people just don't like the way it looks. You know, as a society, we're vain, so it's certain things that are imperfect in our body, we just don't like it, to each their own. More than not, most people will say, I feel this lump down there. It feels like a marble or a golf ball, and it just hurts. Like, there's no tomorrow. And that usually happens after a hard bowel movement, after some explosive diarrhea or something like that. So those are the common symptoms that I'll hear from my patients when they come into the office. And when I hear these sorts of things, I'm thinking, okay, this is what I'm gonna look for when I do my exam. Internal hemorrhoids, rarely, rarely, rarely are they ever painful. So when someone tells me they're having pain and they're having hemorrhoids, first thought in my mind is, okay, something's wrong here, this doesn't, this doesn't jive. So it's usually painless bleeding. Because the reason being is that once you go up to here in the anal canal, there's no nerve fibers. So I could touch you all day long with a soldering iron, pins and needles poke at you, and you would never know it except that I'm telling you I'm doing it. So there are no sensory nerve fibers once you get above this line, basically, up there. The way our rectum and our colon feels pain is by air and distension. So if you have a lot of gas, you start to feel discomfort and pain. That's what our pain receptors in the colon are telling you, that there's, hey, there's too much in here, I gotta get some of this out. They don't feel touch and heat and cold like our skin does, so different uh, receptors. Itching. What can happen is sometimes these can grow and they can uh, fall out of the anus, so to speak, and they'll irritate the skin around the anus. And so people will complain of uh, itching, they'll complain of mucus discharge, and it just irritates the skin around the anus. And that's where the itching comes from. Then they'll say that 
when I go to the bathroom and it's drained, I feel something popping out and I either have to push it back in myself or it just kind of stays out all the time. Even if I try to push it back in, it just always stays out. So those are the kind of complaints I'll get. And then they'll also, I'll get people say, you know, I feel like when I go to the bathroom and I evacuate everything, I just don't feel like I get everything out. I feel like in about 15, 20, 30 minutes, I'm gonna come back again just because I just feel like there's something still left in there. So these are the most common things. When people tell me these things, okay, I'm, I'm starting, my mind is already thinking, all right, this is what I'm gonna look for on my exam. What causes them to be problematic? So these aren't all the things, but these are the most common things. We already talked about pregnancy. When the, you know, the female pelvis carries a, you know, an extra 20, 30 pounds of weight, well, that, what that does is that engorges the blood down there and it prevents the blood from leaving the veins and the arteries down there. So that's why that, that becomes an issue. Constipation, the more you strain, the more you push, the more blood engorges down there, the more pressure there is down there. Constipation isn't something that we do once and it never happens again. It's usually something that people deal with for years and years and years. And the reason, you may, you may hear people say, oh, well, if you have hemorrhoids and you know, people in your family have hemorrhoids. Well, the reason being is that it's not so much that we found a genetic link, but families tend to eat the same things. They tend to do the same things together. And so that's why we find that when one person in the family has hemorrhoids, yeah, it's not unusual for other people in the family to have hemorrhoids as well. <laughs> Prolonged straining. The more you strain, the more blood engorges down there and it can't get out of there. So it just, over time, it puts constant wear and tear on that area. So it stretches that tissue out. And so the laxity disappears after a while. Diarrhea. You wouldn't think that diarrhea causes hemorrhoids, but very rarely do you have one episode of diarrhea. When someone gets food poisoning or if they have problems with their GI system and they have diarrhea, it's usually you know, over and over and over again which puts you on the toilet you know, more than once, more than you would normally if you weren't having diarrhea. And so that's why you, uh, diarrhea can sometimes cause hemorrhoids as well. The other thing is that you can sometimes, if you have really bad you know, fish or seafood or what have you, you get explosive diarrhea. So it's also more force, more pressure down there. <coughs> Aging, as we mentioned, the wear and tear on the body starts to show itself, the muscle begins to atrophy. Those cushions aren't, the, aren't as elastic as they used to be when we're in our 20s and 30s. So exam, so I'm not sure if you can see this with the lights or whatnot. So there's two different types of hemorrhoids here. The red things right here, these are internal hemorrhoids. The lighter pink things on the outside, external hemorrhoids. So this person has a combination of internal and external hemorrhoids. These are also external hemorrhoids. This is what's left behind when you have a big clot on the outside. You know, most, most people, in this room or ideal body weight. But if you miraculously ballooned up to, you know, let's say 400 pounds or something like that, you miraculously, even more miraculously, got back down to your body weight, well, you see on patients that have had gastric bypass surgery, you know, that skin doesn't disappear, it stays. Well, that's exactly what happens on your body, is that skin stays behind. The elasticity is gone. Once it gets stretched out, the elasticity is gone. And most people, the skin doesn't go back to how it was before. So they'll be left with these external tags. Some people will call them skin tags. Some people call them, you know, just the external hemorrhoids. They're all the same thing. Everybody's talking about the same thing. This is what it looks like when there's a clot in there. And this is what they'll complain of is painful. It's because the blood cannot leave this area. It's clotted off, so there's no way for that blood to leave. Most of the time, if people get to my office in the first day or two that this has happened, all I have to do, put a little numbing medication, take the clot out, and it usually saves them about a week or two weeks worth of pain. Once you get about 48 to 72 hours out from that, then there's no benefit of taking the clot out because it's not gonna reduce anything. Because then I'm gonna do more damage by cutting in the office than I am in terms of benefit. More hemorrhoids. So these are all external hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids. External hemorrhoids. You might find it shocking to take pictures, but pictures are one of the best ways my patients can help me out. Everybody gets nervous in a doctor's office. I would get nervous if I went to a doctor's office. You can't relax in a doctor's office. It's, it's, especially for what I do. No one's gonna, you know, it's bad enough that I have to, you know, you know undress patients and kind of tell them what I'm gonna do to them. And then to expect them to relax is sometimes unreasonable. So what I tell patients is, look, if we can't get the answers we need in the office, no big deal. Next time you go home, take a picture. Show me what you're experiencing. Show me what you see. And people at first will say, 
But I get patients that send me pictures of, you would not believe the pictures I get sent. It would, just, it would, it would baffle your mind the pictures patients send me. But it makes my life so much easier. It makes my job easier because I can see exactly what they're experiencing at home. And sometimes it's different from what I see in the office. More often than not, it reaffirms what I'm seeing in the office. And I can explain things a little bit better to them also in the picture because we have a diagram that's of their own butt rather than of a generic picture or a textbook or something like that when I explain it. So don't be alarmed if your doctor asks you to take pictures. There's a reason for that. Yes, ma'am. On the previous slide, yes, ma'am. This one? How would a person get to that stage? I would imagine there'd be a lot of pain prior to this. You'd be amazed at what people can ignore if they want to. You would be amazed. Yeah, people can ignore all sorts of things to avoid going to the doctor. Usually, my men more so than my females, but they, uh, people will do just about anything to not go to the doctor. The other thing is that, you know, we live in a society where it's all about work, 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 work. So the number one thing is that I don't have time to go to the doctor. That looks like so actually, that's actually not painful. Yeah, it's it's uncomfortable and you know it causes mucus discharge and bleeding and things like that. But that's actually not painful. Yeah. This one is painful because this one actually had clots on the inside. So this patient I actually had to take to surgery the next day. So this one was painful. This is the one time where internal hemorrhoids become painful. Is when there's actually clots in them and I can't push them back in. And that person's screaming bloody murder. And so I know it, and I have to do something at that point. Treatment. So how do we treat them? Completely different ways. Let's start with external hemorrhoids, because that's the one I explained to you first. So fiber, prevention. You'll notice a common theme on here, fiber, if nothing else. Yeah. So I tell them, OK, you know, if it's within the first 24 to 48 hours, I'll try to take out the clot. And I still get them on the fiber, because it's bad enough they already had to go through this one time. I want to make sure they don't have to go through it. If it's already been 48 to 72 hours, I tell them, okay, the damage is done, but this is how we're gonna decrease the pain for you. First and foremost, we have to minimize the strength. The best way to do that is to take fiber. And I'll explain to you how it works and why I recommend that. I talked about removing the clot. If I can get them in the first 24 to 48 hours, that's what I'm gonna do is remove the clot. And then surgery. And we'll talk about the surgery in a little bit as well. So my men, strikingly and shockingly, are notorious for this. I can't tell you, I would venture to say about 75% of the guys that come through my office with hemorrhoid problems treat their bathroom like it's a library. What I mean is they have all sorts of magazines in there, they take books in there, they take their cell phones in there. One of my guys takes his laptops in there and conducts business in the uh, bathroom. So, yeah, so people, and I ask why, you know, why? It's, just, it's the only break I can get. You know? So, you know, so fair enough. To teach their own, like I said, but. The first and foremost thing I have to teach, uh, and sometimes some of my female patients as well, is that the bathroom is not a library. So don't have anything in there that gives you incentive to want to stay in there. My best friend keeps a TV in his bathroom. It's only a matter of time before he get, he's going to give me a phone call. He yeah, literally has a TV in his bathroom. So I tell people, there should be no reason to go into your bathroom except to urinate, shower, or evacuate your bowels. If you're not doing those three things, you need to get out as soon as you can. It's not a recreation source. It's not a hangout or anything like that. The more you sit on the toilet, the worse the wear and tear on your bottom is. The other thing is that the way the American toilet is designed, unfortunately, it spreads our butt cheeks and puts all the pressure down on the anus. And so that also, sitting on the toilet for a long period of time, just invites problems over a long period of time. Doctor, yes. it's normal to go to the bathroom more than once to evacuate? Yeah, it is. So there's no such thing as normal. For some people, normal is once a day. For other people, normal is once every three days. It doesn't matter if you don't go to the bathroom every day. It does matter if you can't get everything out, if you're straining, if you feel like you're gonna come back in 15, 20 minutes, or if you're starting to have pain before you go because you haven't gone in three days. Those things are not normal, but the number I don't get caught up in. Yes? So if I go two or three times a day? That's normal for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the way I look at it is, if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> when it bothers you, then it bothers me. That's my philosophy on that. As long as it's not controlling your life, I say go as frequently or as little as you want to. Rubber band ligation. So you may have heard about this if you've had friends or relatives or you've even had this done. And basically what we do is, because I mentioned there's no nerve endings, you know, once you get above this line, we can put rubber bands on these things. So the problem isn't that we have internal hemorrhoids. The problem is they've outgrown 
where they're supposed to be as they start to sag down here. So that becomes the problem. So what we do with the rubber band ligation is we don't put a rubber band on the head of it and just get the hemorrhoid off. We just pull this thing up, higher up, and just put a rubber band up here so that this is no longer down here, it's up here. And that's all we're doing, we're just tacking it up so that it stops drooping with the rubber band ligation. So the hemorrhoid stays there, we're just keeping it from engorging with blood because it's not high in the high pressure zone of the anal canal. Cannot, do not ever, ever, ever let somebody rubber band your external hemorrhoids. I had a doctor come into my office and she tried to put a yarn around her external hemorrhoid because it had one of these clots on it. And she got a mirror and she did this to herself. And it came in and her skin was dead. It's putting a, putting a tie around this is the same thing as putting a noose around your finger. It is only a matter of time before it dies and develops a significant infection. So do not ever let somebody put a uh, rubber band or any sort of tie on that sort of thing. That is not how you treat it, and it will hurt. Because there are plenty of nerve endings down here. There's a lot more nerve endings down here on your bottom than there are in your eye, or not in your eyes, but in your skin, your feet, whatnot. Keep in mind, the anus has to be responsible for detecting the difference between gas, liquid, and stool. It's the only thing in the body that can let one out and contain the other two. Your hands can't even do that. If you put gas, liquid, and stool in your hands, ask, and I ask you to let one out, not the other, impossible. But your anus can do that on a day-in, day-out basis. Imagine how many nerve endings it must take in order to do that. And that's why you put a cut on someone's skin, oh, no big deal. You put a cut on someone's bottom, they start screaming bloody murder. There's that many nerve endings. So, again, never rubber band external hemorrhoids. You can rubber band internal hemorrhoids. Why is there a medical reason not Internal yeah, so why, cut it, why not cut it off? So, internal hemorrhoids, when I rubber band these, I can do this in the office with no sedation, no pain medication, nothing. So I can do this in the office. If I have to cut, I have to take it to the operating room. And cutting hurts a lot more than putting a rubber band on there. And so that would be the reason. My preference is to do rubber band ligation if I can because it's quick, it's safer for the patient, it's less pain for the patient. But if it's not amenable, like something like this, I probably couldn't do rubber band ligation on. This is just too extensive. It would take probably six or seven trips to the office over like a three or four month period to do this rather than one trip to the operating room. So for something like this, I would cut. But for something that wasn't this bad, I would prefer rubber band ligation because it's less, less, less painful. So that's the way I see it. Yes, sir? Yeah, they're actually, yeah, they're actually uh, latex free because obviously a lot of patients nowadays have latex. So we use latex-free rubber bands. They're not the ones you can buy in the store. They're, they're special medical grade. Yeah. You can't go, do not try this at all. If you don't know what you're doing, do not do it. Say one more time, sir. No, so what happens in about seven to 10 days, uh, it acts like a noose. It kills that hemorrhoid or that tissue that we pulled up and it falls off in the toilet. So you may see a little bit of blood or some spotting after about seven to 10 days. And so that's how that usually works. So we also don't rubber band people that are on blood thinners like Coumadin or you know, Erextra or things like that. You can't rubber band those people because once the bleeding starts, starts, it won't stop. So that's one uh, group of people that I don't rubber band. Yes, sir, your question in the back. Oh, my question was, does the internal uh, ligation uh, tissue die like the external? And you just answered it. Yeah. <coughs> So, and then surgery. So when I do surgery for this, basically, if the fiber isn't worked, if the quality of life is affected, and it still bothers the patient, it's bleeding, if I can't get the bleeding stopped, then we go to the operating room. And then depending on what uh, is bothering them, if it's just internal hemorrhoids, I basically, I can do a number of different things. I can either tie them back inside so they're not popping out. If it's internal and external hemorrhoids, then I'll cut them all out at the same time. It does hurt. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Women, um, just by you know, the birthing process, have gone through pain down there, so they know what pain is. Men, for the most part, have never, you know, aside from a, if you unfortunately had any trauma down there, you've never experienced, or we've never experienced any pain down there. So if this is the first time anything happens to us down there, you know, it, it hurts. There's just no two ways about it. I have ways to minimize the pain, but I can't take that pain away. Uh, pain away. So I tell people, listen, just trust me on this keep you out of the operating room, it's going to be the happiest thing for you. Because if you ever talk to someone that had hemorrhoid surgery, it hurts. Now we're coming up ways of doing surgery to minimize the pain and decrease the pain and things like that, but it still hurts. Fiber. So this is the one that's going to hopefully prevent you from having problems. So what is fiber? 
So basically, it's a derivative of plants, fruits and vegetables, things like that, and it goes through our GI system. It doesn't get processed. It basically passes through our GI system just the way we ingest it. What does it do? It increases the bulk of our stool. And basically what it does is it packs the stool together and allows it to coat it with water so that it, our stool isn't like long and stringer and multiple you know, pellets or clumps or anything like that. It stays as one solid uh, log, for lack of a better term, sorry. <laughs> and it basically lubricates it so it allows it to slide through the colon a lot easier. I mentioned the increase in the water content. The other thing it does is it increases the bacterial content. In most people, 50% of your stool weight is strictly bacteria. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Let that sink in for a second. 50% of your stool is just strictly bacteria. The way you increase that bacteria in the volume is the fiber. Side effects. So I get a lot more of these complaints from my female patients than I do from my men. You know, but uh, they'll come in and they'll say, you know, I did what you said. God, I just feel so bloated. Just passing a little more gas around my husband, and he commented the other day, or you know whatnot. So yeah, that is one of the side effects, unfortunately, of uh, fiber. So the way you get past that, there's a couple different op options. If you're willing to stick with it, most of the time those side effects subside. The other thing is you can change the type of fiber you use because not every fiber is the same. Yeah, they work in the same way, but there's a little bit of you know a chemical difference in terms of their molecular structure. So some types of fiber may cause those side effects in you, whereas other types may not. So different types of fiber, and these are just different chemical compounds, but they're all fiber. So these are, we all recognize the brand names, you know, Metis, Metamucil, Consol, Citrusol, Fibrocon. There's a million other ones out there, there's a million generic ones as well. They're all the same thing, they're all fiber. So foods with fiber. So when people tell me, when they come into my office and say, oh, I eat a high fiber diet, my very next question, once they get done, you know, giving me their spiel is, all right, well, how many grams of fiber do you eat in your diet? I don't know if it's a high fiber diet. How do you know it's a high fiber diet? So 99% of the people that come into my office don't know what a high fiber diet entails. You just say that, okay, if we eat certain foods that are high in fiber, we assume we eat a high fiber diet. And that's not necessarily the case. So part of my job is educating what it means to eat a high fiber diet, what foods are high in fiber. So you can see, you know, pinto beans, very high in fiber, medium old grand muffin, lettuce. So people think, oh, I eat salads, it gives me a lot of lettuce. But actually, no, salads barely have any you know, fiber in them because the lettuce, you would have to eat the entire head of lettuce just to get six grams of fiber. So lettuce basically has no fiber, it's basically just water. Strawberries, banana. keep in mind, you would have to eat these things every single day in order to get that, and you need to get 25 to 35 grams. So that's, it can be pretty tedious. So what I tell people is, let's not change the way you eat, let's just add something to it a little bit and make it a habit, make it life a lot easier on you. So fiber comes in many different forms. We all know about the flavor and onion. Unflavored. You know about the unflavored one because it doesn't taste very good. It's just kind of grainy and just doesn't taste good. The flavored ones come in. I think uh, I've seen orange. I've seen berry. I've seen uh, lemon. I think I've seen. There's a couple of different flavored powders out there. There's pills also. They started to market the pills with the fiber. The unfortunate part about the pills is most of the pills that I've seen in the drugstores and the grocery stores have about half a gram of fiber per pill. So you would sit there and swallow 40 to 60 pills a day every single day if that's the way you want to go. Which is fine. If that's what you want to do, that's, that's what you can do. Yes, sir? Well, taking fiber in the pills, I mean, that, that, that form like that, does that mess up your system versus no. taking it on a regular basis where it's no. regular foods? doesn't matter how you take it as long as you get it. Oh. does not make any difference. Yes? No. Uh, in the past, Metamucil pills? Yeah. You know, it cost like $23. Yeah. Now... Costco just came out with this new thing. It's I think like ten dollars or yeah. five dollars. The problem is, is that you're gonna you're gonna still spend a lot of money because you're gonna you're gonna swallow forty to sixty pills a day. So it's still gonna end up being a lot more expensive than it needs to be. Gummy bears. If you go to, I'm not promoting Costco or anything. But that's just every, most people have a membership to Costco. So when I go in Costco, they have these gummy bears that are basically just like the gummy bears our kids eat. We used to eat when we were little. They taste just like gummy bears, multiple different flavors except they're made of fiber. So that's a good way to get fiber as well. Cereal. I'm not a big fan of this, but some of my patients love the fiber cereal. So to them, I tell them more power to you, but eat as much of the fiber cereal as you can. I think there's fiber one, and there's a couple of different ones. I, I don't care for the taste, but if you can tolerate the taste and it gets you enough fiber, eat it. Snack bars. Uh, fiber one makes snack bars. Uh, they're basically, I think I've seen oats and chocolate or chocolate chip or something like that. They're pretty good, they're small snack bars. They give you about nine grams of fiber per snack bar. So there's other ones out there too. I've seen uh, fiber cookies, which are reasonable. They're not bad or anything like that. 
Um, I've seen, what else have I seen? Uh, I remember, yeah, fiber chip, the crackers, wafers, which are okay if you have it with a dip or something like that. So there's different ways. So what I tell people is don't focus on counting the fiber in your diet. Let's just add a supplement to it. And the other thing I tell people is, okay, 25 to 35 is the recommendation. But just like with anything else we try in life, we don't go straight for the gusto. Let's just start with half. Let's see how we do with just getting half. Let's just try with 15 to 20 grams a day, and you may just notice a significant difference. Just with that, you may not even have to worry about getting more. So then the next thing I, t I teach my patients is, okay, what's already a habit in your daily routine? For most of us, it's breakfast and dinner. Sometimes it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For some of us, it's lunch and dinner. So what I tell people is the best way to make something else become a habit is attach it to something that already is a habit. If you associate it that way, you never have to remember, when did I take that fiber? How many grams did I take? Did I take it today? Because you know if you ate that meal, you took your fiber. You know if you didn't eat that meal, you missed your fiber. So that's the way I, I like to teach my patients is let's just make it a habit by associating it with something else that's already a habit. And I just divide the dose in half. I say choose whatever you want, 15 to 20 grams, divide it in half, half before breakfast, Half before dinner. To me, it's a no brainer. You don't have to worry about it. You have enough problems worrying about what, what pills you're taking, when you're going to take that pill, how many of those pills you're taking. I need to make this as easy as possible in order to succeed. So that's how I uh, teach my patients. Yes, sir? Do you recommend uh, stool softeners in conjunction? Hate, 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 hate stool softeners. I, I despise stool softeners. The reason being, they have their place, but I don't recommend them for people. And the reason being is they make your schools mushy. They make them soft, they're usually not formed, and it usually just makes a mess when you have to clean up and things like that. And they're really not doing you any favors with stool softeners. The other thing I see with stool softeners, depending on which type you use, is over the long haul, if you become, if you uh, get in the habit of using stool softeners, over a 30 or 40 year uh, period, your colon doesn't function as well anymore because it's been so reliant on the stool softener that it stops squeezing the way it's supposed to. That's why I hate stool softeners. <coughs> How many pills of, of citrus up, for example, do you recommend, or is that just like per day? Oh, you have to, so what I, what I tell you, there's a little bit of math involved. So you have to say, okay, if the pill has, let's say if there's one gram per pill, and you need 15 to 20 grams a day, you need 15 to 20 pills. If the pill only has 500 milligrams, you're gonna need 30 to 40 of those pills a day. So you just have to calculate based on the dosage, how many of those pills you're gonna need. That makes sense to you? Well, what if you get the desire? You try to get the desired results with less pills. Right? You can, you can, yeah. There's not. This is not like a science like it is with blood pressure medication, where you have to take you know 250 milligrams of this and you have to take it. There's a lot of wiggle room in this. A lot of wiggle room. There's a lot of this is trial by error and things like that. And we tailor, you know, the patient's therapy based on how his or her reaction is to what I recommended. If we're kind of close and we're not there yet, all right, let's increase it. If it's, you know, if it's too much, if you're feeling like you're going too often, and you kind of want to scale back a little bit, all right, well, let's cut back a little bit. So a lot of wiggle room in this. Yes, so sir. just basically putting the, uh, the fiber content of the extra to the fiber content of your food that you're taking. Right. So if you ate a cup of pinto beans a day, you wouldn't need 30 pills, you'd only need 50. Right, exactly. Most people, unfortunately, they don't count their fiber. That's the thing. It never hurts to have more fiber. Where do you find that at? I mean, so there are many, many, many different sources. So if the food has a nutrition label on it, that's the easiest place because they have to count for you how many grams are in the serving. The other thing you can do is if you just Google high fiber diet, there's a million things pop up. I think one of I think one of the first ones is the Mayo Clinic of Minnesota. They have a pretty good one that I've used for patients before. But yeah, if you just Google, go on the internet, and Google high fiber diet, and they'll tell you. So. Yes, ma'am. You recommend to eat the five or four in your meal. So I tell people about 15 minutes before the meal. Well, no, it doesn't interfere with that. What it may do is it may let you eat less of your meal, which most of us. I'm mean, I could use that help. You know, so. Yes, sir. Is there any other thing high in fiber like the beans? Yeah, there's uh, there's all all the different beans are very high, like navy beans are extremely high, black beans were pretty high yet. All the different ones in the beans were pretty high at the list. So. It doesn't matter what you use, as long as you use something. So for my patients that have you know, uh, office jobs, well, it's not real conducive in the middle of the day to go to the break room, mixing powder and things like that. So what I tell those patients is, get the gummy bears. Two of those gummy bears give you five grams of fiber. So pop four of those, and that's half your fiber for the day. You keep your water bottle at your desk, so you're prompted to always drink water. So I tailor it based on what the person's lifestyle is, what their occupation is, and things like that. A lot of flexibility. I use the gummy bears at the office. 
I don't have time to run to the break room and mix up fiber and come back and see patients. Just keep a water bottle on my desk, keep the gummy bears in my drawer. That's what I use. In the morning, I use a powder. Right before breakfast, I know every single morning before I come down, that's the first thing I do. So it's a mix and match combination, whatever works for your lifestyle. Yes, sir? Outside of pinto beans, what are the best uh, top three vegetables? Oh, I don't, I don't ever even look at it. Honestly, the only time I ever look at these lists is when I have to get talks. Oh. I don't even look, I never look at these lists. To me, it's irrelevant, because I know I'm not getting enough fiber in my diet. Okay. Yes, sir? Would the fiber content be diluted with how you cook it? No. Yeah. The only thing that happens sometimes is if, if you try to put a powder in water, you, if you've ever done that, it starts to gelatinize and become real tough to drink and things like that. But in food, it doesn't make any difference. So if you like, like pet the beans, you make Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. No. Free yeah. fried beans yeah. with it. Yeah, it doesn't make any difference. Fiber that. Yeah, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So, but if you do the powder, make sure you drink it quickly. Because once it starts to thicken up, it's a little tougher to get it down your throat. Yes, sir? How many grams of fiber that you say you should have for Ideally, the U.S. recommends you get about 25 to 35. What I tell my patients, let's start with half. Let's just start with 15 to 20, and we'll work our way from there. Yes, sir? I think the citrus cell powder was great. Yeah. But if you overdo it, how, how concerned should you be as far as it's clogging up? And you should. I if you said that it'll actually uh, clog up your throat. If you drink enough water, you should never, there's no such thing as too much fiber. The only downside of fiber is if you don't drink water. If you don't get enough water, it will cause bad constipation. Because then you've had all that still clumped together with no lubrication for it to move. So you have to, have to, have to drink water with your fiber. Forms, we talked about that. So before I give you my take home points, any other questions? And I'll be around uh, afterwards as well to answer any questions that anybody doesn't want to go around in front of other people. <laughs> yes, sir. Let's say the problems that you're having are itching and yeah. staining. Yeah. What's the therapy for that? Can't tell you without an exam. I refuse to diagnose people without taking a look. Sorry. Okay. Take home points. Don't self-diagnose. Do not. Do not self-diagnose. I've had patients that tried that and they ended up with an anal cancer. If bleeding and pain don't stop within a week, have a doctor take a look. It's not normal to have blood coming out of your body and to have blood in the That is not normal. It's also not normal to have pain down there. Increase your fiber with diet with supplements. It's the easiest way to do it. It eliminates all the math you have to do in terms of counting how much fiber you're giving every single day. That will get very tedious. Instead, just add a supplement. That way you know you're getting your fiber. Yes, sir? Those gummy bears that you were talking about? Yes, sir. They're not the standard gummy bears. No, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, no, they're not, they're, they're not the standard gummy bears. No, sir. No. Yeah, they're special fiber gummy bears. You can get them in any grocery store, drugstore, no, whatnot. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, in addition to fiber, how about physical exercise? Yeah, that doesn't make a difference with this type of stuff, but I'm um, yet. Yeah, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is your um, practice limited to proctology? Is your practice limited to proctology? No, I do uh, colon and rectal surgery, so anything that involves the colon and rectum in terms of surgical problems, and then I also do bread and butter general surgery. And like then diet? Diet type of. Uh, oh, no, I don't do diet counseling. I'll let my primary care doctor. They know a lot more about that than I do. Well, I thought because of the fact of the timing of this up around 12 o'clock, it keeps you from eating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. At, at what age do you think that uh, you stop having colonoscopy? That you figure you're going to die of something else. Yeah. You die <laughs> no, that's a very good question. Yeah, because you don't, you don't need to be tortured your whole life. So, at beginning at the age of 76, up until 84, you fall into a gray zone where we say, okay, if the person is healthy, you keep going. If they have all sorts of problems, if they just had a heart attack two months ago, if they have you know, terminal cancer, or they have certain things, depending on what their medical history looks like, we say, okay, certain people fall into the category where we're not going to screen them anymore. Certain people fall into the category where they're healthy enough, we need to keep an eye on these people because they're going to be around for a while. So that's a judgment call based on the doctor. Once you get above 84, we stop screening. Because at that point, the risk of the procedure outweighs the benefits of the procedure. Because by that time, chances are, by the time you get a polyp, that polyp becomes a cancer, that cancer metastasizes, you're hopefully already going to be in a better place by that point. That does not mean if you have bleeding or abdominal pain, you don't get a colonoscopy. The distinct difference between screening and diagnostic. Screening means I don't have any symptoms. I'm just looking to make sure nothing's wrong. Diagnostic means something is wrong. I need to find out what that is. So if you're 100 years old and you have 
bleeding, you have pain, you're healthy, yeah, we're putting a camera, we're going to find out what's wrong if you want us to. Thank you. Yes, sir. I want to take a little while with me. No. All right, well, thank you.